Hello everyone and welcome to Math Analytics Masterclasses in its second edition, Season 2. In Season 1, we try to cover all the aspects of the marketing mix modeling workflow, starting from the data collection phase until the delivery of the insights and recommendations. In this season, we will try to dive deeper into specific aspects of that process in order to give you more details and shed more light on the key elements of the Marketing Mix Modeling project. My name is Ramla and I am the co-founder and CEO of Mass Analytics. Welcome to our MMM Masterclasses. In this course, we will talk about data processing, but with a specific zoom onto the transformations that are specific to media variables, mainly DK or ad stock transformation and diminishing returns. If you remember, in season one, we have talked about data processing as one of the most important steps in the marketing mix modeling workflow. Specifically, in episode five, we've talked about the fact that there are different variables that need to be transformed before we ingest them into the model. In the software master, the data processing is performed into the third module, data process. Here you can find all the transformations that you need to apply to your data. Amongst them, you can find specifically the media transformations that we'll be covering in today's course, which are DK or ad stock and diminishing returns. DK or ad stock transformation. In real life, we know that advertising doesn't necessarily have an immediate impact on the consumer behavior. And that's why we need to transform any media variable we have in order to account for the prolonged effect that a media variable would have on sales. For that, we use actually the ad stock transformation by applying a decay to the media variables that we have collected in the first place. Decay describes the percentage of the message that is being lost period on period. For example, if you are modeling at the wiki level, and if you mention that your decay is 30%, it means that week on week, there is 30% of the initial message that is being lost. What we generally do is that we create different versions of this decay, varying the parameter of the decay, 10%, 20%, 30%, and so forth. And then later on in the modeling stage, we try to understand which of those decays really mattered, in the sense that which one was really the most impactful one when it comes to sales and consumer response. Now we need to understand that the higher the decay, the less that message will stay in the consumer's mind. In this illustration, we have created two decays, 30% and 90%. We can clearly see from this graph that actually for the 90%, the carryover effect is much shorter than the 30%. That's because in the context of the 30%, we are assuming that 30% of the message is being lost week on week. Whereas in the context of the 90%, most of the message, that is 90% of it, is being lost every single week. So the carryover that is being created by the 30% decay is much higher than the carryover that is being created by its 90% counterpart. There is an interesting variation of the ad stock or decay transformation, the cutoff point. What the cutoff point allows you to do is to cut the carryover starting from a certain number of periods. In order to distinguish between the short-term effect of advertising and the medium slash long-term effect of advertising. So any tail that goes beyond the cutoff point will be accounted as medium long-term effect of advertising when any carryover that happens before the cutoff point will be accounted for as short-term effect of advertising. That will give us two variables that we can test later on in the modeling stage in order to model the short-term effect of advertising and the medium slash long-term effect of advertising. Diminishing returns. One of the most popular transformations in the context of media variables when running your marketing mix modeling project is diminishing returns. 
What diminishing returns depict is the fact that as your spend increases, your sales or your revenue that is being generated out of this spend will keep increasing. However, it will increase at a decreasing pace until it reaches full saturation. That's exactly what diminishing returns refer to. The diminishing returns concept is fully realized when you talk about optimization. What happens during the optimization is that those diminishing returns curves that have been created in the data processing phase and then the ones that end up being retained in the final model would be the basis of your optimization. So any optimization exercise will move money from the curves that are highly saturated to the curves that are less saturated, generating in such exercise an enhancement in the revenue without really changing the size of your budget. There are different methods to account for diminishing returns. And there are different mathematical transformations that allow us to have this nice shape of diminishing returns. For example, the exponential function, the ATAN, the add back, etc., etc. These are just a few examples that you can use. However, what I would like to highlight here is that there are two types of diminishing return curves that you can create. There is the C-shaped curve, which is concave all the way through, and we have the S-shaped curve. These two functions have different characteristics, yield different results, and different recommendations and insights. So what I advise you to do is to have a discussion with your client, whether internally or externally, in order to understand what type of insight they are after. And based on that, you make a choice on whether you are going for C-shaped or S-shaped curves. One of the mathematical functions that could be used in order to illustrate the concept of these nice C-shaped curves is the exponential function. You can see the formula on the screen. In this formula, we have one parameter, that's the gamma factor. What that gamma factor represents is kind of the saturation of your curve. The smaller the gamma, the faster your curve will reach saturation. For example, in the curves that are displayed on the screen, we have varied the gamma factor. And we can clearly see that the red curve that has the smallest gamma factor is the one that reaches the saturation the fastest when you compare it to the other curves that you have in the graph. To illustrate the concept of diminishing returns, we can also go for the S-shaped curves, as opposed to the C-shaped curves that we have explained earlier. Now you have to understand that if you use the S-shaped curve, you have two phases in that curve. The first phase is where you have an exponential function, and that means that during that phase of spend, you have increasing marginal returns. They will keep increasing until they reach a point that we call mathematically the inflection point. Starting from, from that point, the marginal returns becomes decreasing. And that will be your phase two. So your diminishing returns only kick in starting from the inflection point. Before that point, which is phase one, any spend you are making will be generating increasing marginal returns. One of the examples that we can use in order to illustrate the concept of the S-shaped curve is the add back function and you can see the formula on my screen and some of the curves that could be generated by using this formula. One of the most interesting insights that one can get from the application of the S-shaped curve is the derivation of what is called the optimal execution range or the interval in which it is optimal to invest on that particular channel. Now, how do we obtain this optimal execution range? In the graph that you can see on the screen, we have three curves here. We have the yellow curve, which is the marginal ROI curve. We have the blue curve, which is the average ROI curve. And we have the diminishing return curve, the S-shaped one, that is represented by the area curve that you see in the graph. Now, the maximum of the marginal ROI curve happens at point A. 
the maximum of the average arrow y curve happens at point B. The execution range is actually the area or the range between point A and B. So let's explain this range. Now, at point A, your marginal arrow y hits its maximum. However, when you compare in the zone A to B, the maximum marginal arrow y to the average arrow y, it's still higher than the average arrow y. So keeping investing on that channel when you are between A and B will improve your maximum or your average arrow y. However, starting from point B, what happens is that your yellow curve is now lower than your uh, blue curve, which means that your marginal arrow y is lower than your average arrow y, which means that if I keep spending beyond point B, my average arrow y will be smaller than before. And that's where we think we should be stopping investment on that channel because it's not interesting to see your arrow y dropping compared to what it used to be at point B. Now, this analysis that I have made for the, uh, the S-shaped curve is very interesting. However, it only holds when you look at one channel at a time. When you are in an optimization exercise, you will be optimizing budget across different channels. And here what will matter is the size of your marginal returns or your marginal ROI when it's compared to the other curves. So please make sure that in your optimization, when you decide to allocate budget across different channels, that you consider all the curves at the same time, rather than looking at the optimal execution range for every single media channel taken separately. Now, how can we obtain this optimal execution range if we are in the context of the C-shaped curve? The problem with the C-shaped curve is that the maximum ROI or the maximum marginal ROI happens at almost a value of zero of spend. So we cannot really apply the same concept as earlier on. This could be replaced by the analysis of the profit curve. So what we can do, we can derive our profit curves, and then we can say that our optimal execution range happens between the point where our profit is maximum and until our profit start to become negative. And that will be the area that will determine the optimal execution range of the channel that has the C-shaped uh, diminishing returns uh, of investment. Thank you very much for watching. I hope these videos uh, added some increments to your marketing mix modeling knowledge. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel to see more videos like this. Please comment in case you have any questions and it would be my pleasure to get back to you with all the answers that you are seeking in the context of these videos and in the context of marketing measurement and marketing mix modeling. Thank you very much.